out of my own family, uh, everybody uh, that wasn't in Budapest was deported. And I'm talking really about cousins of my parents, aunts and uncles of my parents, the cousins, children, etc. And out of maybe 40 people, 50 people, I know 30 odd by name, uh, three returned. Uh, rest were all murdered. Meanwhile, we were living uh, almost normally. Um, there was a curfew for Jews. Um, but actually, my father uh, had a business which carried on. My grandfather had a business, a shop, which was uh, open. And one of his best customers was a, a, a German lady, if I may call her that, who was the wife of the German governor of the country, Wiesen Bank. And uh, she liked him very much. And she said to him, uh, Mr. Rosenberger, uh, Get, gather your family and leave the country as soon as possible, which was very good advice, but of course it wasn't possible to, to carry it out. Um, <clears throat> around uh, September, um, the gendarmes and police, these are all Hungarians. I should say that my, my story is uh, the, 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 the murderers and killers were all Hungarians. Only one German will appear in my story. Uh, <clears throat> they came round to the uh, apartment house. They uh, called for every uh, Jew to come downstairs. Then they searched the house. Um, you couldn't hide that you, whether you were Jews or not because every paper had a great big ZS on it in red, every document to show that you're a Jew. So my father was taken and we hadn't heard anything about him for the next two months. The uh, rest of us were, uh, my grandfather was too old, the rest of us were uh, left in this flat. Then <clears throat> next thing that happened was um, they came and uh, all Jewish women under eight sixty were collected together and removed. Um, this included my mother and my aunt. My aunt also had a baby. My cousin who now lives in Sydney, um, six months older than me. And the two women were taken away to a point of collection where there were thousands of similar women, etc. cetera. And um, they, were the, they were both breastfeeding. And um, as, a, as a kind of last, um, last resort action, my mother, I should just say that the guards were all Hungarians, but there were a few German regular soldiers amongst the guards as well. And uh, my mother went up to one of the Germans and she was fluent in German. In fact, it was the first language. She only learned Hungarian when she went to school. And she said to him, look, my sister and I are here. Our babies are at home. They will die if we don't go home. And this fellow, this is the German in my story, uh, obviously a conscript, maybe a farm lad, uh, started swearing at them and, and uh, told them to get out of here. In other words, let, let them go. And uh, the Hungarians didn't dare to countermand the German. So my parents, my parents, my sis, my mother and aunt came back home. And uh, part of the story is that my aunt had collected or found somewhere some cyanide, cyanide pills. And she gave these to, the, uh, to my grandmother to say, give this to the babies if we don't return. And uh, okay, so that's, uh, uh, fortunately they returned and uh, uh, that was one of many, many lucky accidents. I could say that uh, just in summary, uh, a summary in the middle, that the reason we survived was, was uh, courage and uh, determination on the part of my parents, um, help from non-Jews, and a uh, tremendous amount of luck. And if you don't have these lucky breaks, then of course you're one of the 
one of the ones who didn't survive. Um, next event I want to mention is um, to do with Karl Lutz. Karl Lutz was a Swiss um, diplomat. He was quite a lowly diplomat, but because everybody else had left the country, he was in charge of the Swiss embassy and consulate. And the Swiss were also responsible for representing the uh, mandate of Palestine diplomatically, because the British were obviously not, uh, there was no diplomatic contact with the British. And this man, Karl Lutz, uh, persuaded the Hungarian government that um, he has permission for 8,000 Jews to be, uh, to emigrate to Palestine. And after some negotiations, he was allowed uh, this as it was agreed. Um, and what he did was he issued uh, called Schutzpasses, and then Wallenberg, very well known, did the same afterward. Uh, and this pass said that so and so, and in fact, he changed instead of 8,000 people, it was 8,000 families. This family is on a collective passport to go to Palestine after hostilities uh, cease. Uh, it took three days of queuing uh, for my mother, but she managed to get one of these. I have it at home. Uh, it's a document which for a while had a lot of value, while the uh, uh, Hungarian officials respected it. After about November, it had no value at all. But anyway, it was important for us. And I just want to mention it especially because Carlos deserves to be known and uh, honored, honored really. Um, <clears throat> when he, when he, direct digression, but when he went back home after the, uh, after the war, back to Switzerland, he was uh, demoted for uh, overstepping his authority. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, we're getting now to the, to the time that um, the ghetto was established in Budapest. Uh, all Jews were uh, uh, forced to go into the ghetto on pain of death. Um, but there were exceptions. The exceptions were that Lutz and Wallenberg and the Red Cross and also the Vatican bought some buildings and declared them to be extraterritorial. So they would have a Swedish flag on or whichever one of these organizations. And again, uh, this was respected by the Hungarians uh, up to a certain point in the year. Uh, there was a Red Cross home for children and my mother managed to get my sister and I, and my cousin as well, into one of these um, where we couldn't leave, but inside we, we had a degree of protection. Adults were not taken on, but my mother was able to get a job as a washerwoman. And uh, my sister remembers that she wasn't allowed to uh, let on that this was her mum. Otherwise, she might have been put out. But anyway, we were there. Um, and my grandparents and great-grandmother were in the ghetto. Ghetto was very overcrowded, there was no food, uh, tremendous amount of disease, a uh, lot of people died of typhus. Meanwhile, my father, um, he was collected, he was taken to uh, various places, lethal places where after the war, the commandant and the camp doctor were both hanged for war crimes. Uh, and. Uh, well, it was, it was a terrible place. They, he managed to escape, believe it or not. They were being marched uh, across uh, a bridge and he decided that uh, if he goes across this bridge, he's going to be dead anyway. And he turned round and walked the other way. There were, of course, armed guards, so he waited to be shot, but he wasn't. Uh, never know why, whether he was missed or the person concerned didn't, you know, didn't want to have it on his conscience or whatever, but that's what happened. Um, <clears throat> he uh, then 
found a, a bombed out house. Uh, the city was in, in, in a very bad state. Uh, and he managed to uh, go up to the fourth floor. The way this was done is, is with a ladder because half the, half, half the building was missing. There was no, no staircase. And he lived with three or four other men in the same situation on the fourth floor for uh, a number of days. Uh, meanwhile, a good friend of his, his name was Lajos Balla, uh, managed to get force papers uh, for him. They were actually not force in the sense they were real papers, they were not uh, counterfeit, except they were made out in force names and force uh, data. Um, they were called Kraus, <clears throat> which was in, in Germany it's common, but in, in Hungary it's a very, it's only, only Jews would be called that. Uh, so he, he couldn't um, keep that name, of course couldn't keep the religion, so, and he even couldn't keep his date of birth, otherwise he would have been liable for call up in the Hungarian army as a non-Jew. So uh, he chose a new surname, which is the one you know, Kiev. Um, the reason he chose this was we used to live in Kiev Street and uh, he wanted a name that my sister could remember without uh, hesitation. How old was your sister? Sister was eight at the time. Um, with his new identity he got, uh, he got a job. He worked in a munitions factory and he found himself a, a room. Uh, which he could rent, and, and he lived there for two or three weeks. His papers said he was a refugee from south of the country, uh, Serbian Orthodox in religion, and uh, place of birth and date of birth were different. And he told the people where he was that he's found his uh, family, and he came to see us in this Red Cross home. The conditions there were so terrible that he's, he decided he has to remove us, um, which he did. We, 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 had to, we walked out without yellow stars, of course. That in itself was a capital offense if, if caught. But we made it to this uh, flat where he was. Um, How old were you? Well, I, I was five months by then. Um, and that's where we were for a week or two. Uh, by this time, the Russians were advancing, uh, pushing back the Germans um, for reasons I won't go into. Both uh, Hitler and Stalin decided that one, that Budapest had to be defended, the other, that Budapest had to be taken, uh, even though their, the military on both sides said there is no, no military need, no strategic need for the city. Um, so it was defended to the last man by the Germans. Uh, the Russians fought house by house, street by street. It took six weeks uh, for them to uh, conquer the, uh, re, 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 uh, okay. what, reclaim, let's say, the city. During that time, all infrastructure, of course, uh, 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 there, there just wasn't anything. There was so much rubble in the streets, you couldn't walk. Uh, there was no food, um, and there was bombing and shooting in the streets, so it was lethal to go out. We spent, like everybody else, civilians, uh, our time in uh, in a basement, a cellar. Um, these uh, blocks of flats. These are all think of Paris, you know, the proper big blocks. Of blocks all had very big basements and basements actually adjoined one another. And um, we were down there for two or three weeks and we were starving to death basically because not, there was nothing to eat. Um, <clears throat> we managed to survive. There were three, three reasons. One is we got a few potato peel from a neighbor who had potatoes. Uh, they didn't, none of these people know, knew that we were Jews. Um, Another one was my father when he could virtually not walk from weakness because of course if there was any food they gave it to the children or at least to my sister because I couldn't, I don't think I could take solid. Um, he managed to go back 
to this place where it used to be on the fourth floor because they knew that they left some food behind. Um, and this was a very, very dangerous uh, mission because there, there was shooting on the, on the streets. Plus anybody, you know, if a Hungarians caught a Jew, they would shoot him anyway. Um, and there was bombardment from the air. Uh, he made it and made it back, which was a miracle because he was already so weak. Uh, and it came back with, I think, two or three jars of jam. But that kept us going for a couple of days. And then the last, well, I won't go into it. Anyway, we found, we found some more food elsewhere, but it was all uh, very, very uh, marginal because my parents were by then so weak. Uh, because of the uh, lack of food, my mother had no milk. So I, I was really in the worst possible condition. Uh, it was 15th of January when the Russians really, uh, reached the place that we were. And then uh, we were liberated. And uh, although the Russians were, they're not Russians actually, I should say Soviets, because most of them were from Mongolia and, and uh, Asia, the Soviets. Um, there was a lot of raping and pillaging and, and looting, uh, but it meant we stayed, stayed alive. And my father was fluent in Russian, and as a result, the Red Army got him uh, immediately to be uh, translated to help them, which meant that we immediately had access to, to reasonable quality food and in enough, large enough quantities. Um, the lab, uh, ghetto was liberated two or three days later. My grandparents returned and my great grandmother, but she already had typhus and she died within uh, two days uh, after being liberated. Um, this is almost the end of the story. So we, we, all four of us survived. Um, the, the aftermath was I was in terrible state. They said I looked like a newborn from lack of nourishment. You were uh, seven months by then? I was seven months by then. Um, I always think about how terrible it must have been for a mother uh, not, not to be able to give any food to her baby and see them starve away. Uh, but of course, I, I, I have no memory of this. I, I know it very well. Uh, and always feel a bit guilty because I, I was just a hindrance for my parents, basically, and uh, some baggage to carry around. I was very ill, and um, they wanted to take me to a hospital, and um, they had to walk everywhere. Uh, also, it was a very cold winter, lots of snow, and my father, on the way to this hospital, found a red star, five-pointed communist star, on the in the snow and put it in his lapel. We get to the hospital and they say immediately, no, we, want, we can't take anybody, uh, it's full up, we have no electricity, we have no medication, uh, we barely have enough water, although you could have water by melting the snow. Um, they wouldn't take it, but my father made a, a big fuss, which he was very good at, you know, a big loud voice, and uh, demanded to see the uh, director of the hospital, who then came, and when he saw that he was wearing a little red star, he assumed that he must be a big communist official, and said, yes, yes, of course, sir, or comrade, but could you see if you can get some, some medicines and some supplies for us? And my father said, yes, yes, all right. Um, I was taken in, as I say, no medication. Uh, I had, uh, pneumonia and uh, TB and whooping cough and terminal starvation and something else which I can't remember uh, all at the same time uh, after a day or two they told my mother to, to say goodbye because I wasn't going to survive I did and things improved and Obviously, I, I, I made it and, and uh, recovered fully. Um, that's, that's the end of the fascist part of the story. Um, Do you want to get, take questions now? 
shall I stop there and ask for questions? Um, if you or don't carry mind, on, if you don't mind, Tom, um, would you would you prefer that, or would you prefer to carry on? I prefer to carry on, really. Okay, then, then, then we'll okay. carry on. Uh, then um, I make this this chapter quite short. A very interesting uh, four years followed. Uh, which during which time there was a democratic government in Hungary and things went very well. My father uh, uh, had a business, started a business immediately. Um, that's another story of how, but uh, he, uh, it, was, it was the best time of his life really. Uh, in, in many ways, we lived in, uh, we moved to a very large spacious flat. Uh, we had everything we, we wanted. He had a chauffeur-driven car. Uh, my sister went to private school. Uh, this, you know, we, we lived exceptionally well. And he did this from nothing because, of course, we lost everything in the war. Uh, then in, uh, and I had a, a, a very good time, very, uh, what I can remember, very happy time. When I was about four, Communists came to power through a putsch, and um, life changed 180 degrees uh, because now the problem wasn't that we were Jews, the problem was that we were capitalists. Um, because my father employed 100 people and had a business that obviously, you know, you know the capitalist dogma, it made him a class enemy and uh, uh, what, what's the word? I'm, I'm looking for the word, doesn't matter. Um, and uh, the business was nationalized, which means taken away. Uh, he was kept on for two months while they, they put in a, a, a manager who then was a decent person and told my father that his only job was to make sure that uh, he puts my father in jail for some kind of fraud or irregularity, uh, but especially knowing this, that that, that didn't happen. Um, so uh, he survived that. Uh, financially, of course, it was a disaster. Then I remember after that, uh, he was getting uh, tax bills, which he couldn't pay. Bailiffs used to come around to our, our home, put stamps on the door to say nothing can be taken. He was, uh, without a job, because as a class enemy, he wasn't allowed. To, there, was, uh, no, there were no businesses. You couldn't even be a, a one-man business. You had to be employed, and as a class enemy, he, did, he wouldn't be, couldn't be employed. Uh, that went on for about a year. Then he was uh, employed as, as a manual worker in a factory, in a public company where he used to be a, a director, technical director before the war. Um, my parents had it pretty hard because uh, they had to work very hard to get anything. Uh, there was never a shortage of food, although there might have been a shortage of different items, but Hungary was a very productive country, uh, agriculturally. Uh, but there was a shortage of everything else. Um, and they had to work very hard, two jobs. My mother had never worked previously. Um, but I, I uh, being a child, I had a, I had a good normal childhood. Uh, all my friends had nothing either. So you know what kids are like, everything is normal. You or compare yourself with your, your mates. And uh, uh, we made our own games. I was affected by the communist uh, uh, system in as much as when I came top of the class or even the year, which was a regular event, uh, they told my parents that they couldn't possibly give me the prize because, you know, a class enemy, you had, the prize had to go to proletariat, which means factory worker or better still, a peasant. Um, but these were, compared with what uh, we had lived through before, I'm talking about my parents, these were very easy, uh, very easy times. Actually, they were very hard times. Um, one of the differences there 
it's again when everybody's in the same boat it's much easier to 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 cope with problems um, my for instance you hear a lot of that uh, Jewish uh, refugees in England never talked about the war until the uh, you know the last 20 years uh, this was absolutely not the case in my environment in Budapest we uh, there were about 60 70 thousand Jewish people who survived in Budapest and they all had uh, out of 250 or something like that and they all had the same story you know the men had all been uh, in uh, forced labor if they came back or in many families they didn't come back so that they, they were lost at the fathers if they survived everybody talked openly about it because you know everybody had the same same background um this went on till 1956 in 1956 there was an uprising um, and as a result of that uprising uh, the borders were open for a short while and a lot of people including ourselves left the country um, my uh, father always planned to leave uh, in 1938 already uh, my aunt and uncle different one to the ones during the war left and came to England um and the idea was that we would follow but before that could happen the war was declared and then after the war when it would have been possible to leave around 1946 to 48 my father was doing too well and decided no no he'll wait uh not yet so in 56 he didn't hesitate and uh we left we escaped of course you were not allowed to to leave but there was great confusion the uh, earlier government fell the soviets came in uh, there was a puppet government but it wasn't yet in charge because the soviet army was in charge red army was in charge and and civil servants people including border guards didn't really know if if uh, they were going to be put in prison uh, or you know or rewarded i mean nobody knew what was going on and in this confusion it was possible to escape which my father organized um, it for me as a 12 year old it was a great adventure um, we uh, had to walk across the border we walked for about eight hours in the middle of the night in the snow uh, it wasn't snowing but it was very cold ice we had to uh, cross iced up rivers so we were also soaking wet which froze um, but we all survived it and uh, we arrived in austria not knowing that we were in austria um, we were taken to a camp where we were uh, given second-hand clothes and food we had, we had nothing of course again this is the third time my father lost everything we left everything behind um, my mother made sure we brought toothbrush and toothpaste with us uh, and towels but that was about it um, we made it up to Vienna um, where uh, an, a family uh, member came had come over from the US it's a long story anyway they left some money for us we were in a hotel and the my father went to the british consulate long story short we were allowed to come to britain and after two weeks in austria we landed uh, in england a day later we were in golders green where my aunt was living uh, we slept on the floor for six weeks my parents uh, my father was in his 50s uh, not a word of english but he was a very happy man and uh, within two weeks he found a job as did my mother uh, they worked very hard i had an easy time i was a schoolboy, and that's the end of my childhood story i mean the rest of it was a normal english um, you know schoolboy childhood thank you i'm ready for questions uh, thank you tom um, i'm gonna unmute everyone in a minute 
um, that seeing as it's my finger on the button to unmute, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, it was such a long story with, with, with so much. I, 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 you painted certain pictures for me, Tom, um, and, and you mentioned one thing. You said that you needed a lot of luck. Well, we, we all know, you know, everybody, we, we all need elements of luck in, in our life. But, but you know, I'm, I'm also a believer that you make your own luck. And the other thing that really, really struck me was, was you said that your father spoke Russian. Yes. You know, so this is for someone who is not a linguist. I'm, I'm not a linguist and, and, and I really regret that. Um, but, you know, was it lucky he spoke Russian or, or he actually had the ability to speak Russian? So, you know, he, it wasn't just luck. He, he, he was able to do things and he obviously was, was a bright man. But, you know, how did he, why, would, why did he speak Russian fluently? Okay, easy to answer. If, if not short, um, after the first well, after the first world war, at the end of the first world war, uh, my grandfather's business went bankrupt. He was away in the army, came back, and there's financial crisis. Uh, it was bankrupt. Also, it was a time of Spanish flu. My father had the Spanish flu, became very ill, uh, but recovered. He was 19 at the time. And he decided that as, as the family was in trouble, he was going to emigrate uh, and make his fortune in the world. Now, it just so happened he went to a commercial uh, school, commercial college, and in his last year, which must have been about 1916 or 17, they were taken to Bulgaria as a, as a, as a stage, as a six-week stay. I think they worked in a bank. Uh, so the only foreign country that he knew anything about was Bulgaria. And when he decided to seek his fortune in the world, unfortunately, he didn't choose England. He chose Bulgaria. Um, and it was, he lived there for 14 years. When I married my mother, they lived there together for four years. So he was fluent, uh, speaker of Bulgarian. And that is uh, virtually the same language. Um, he, he made two mistakes in his life. The second mistake was, in 1938 that they left Bulgaria, which of course, where you know that the Jews all survived uh, and came back to Hungary. So that they made two mistakes, unfortunately. But that's, that's how he actually was fluent in Bulgarian, but it was close enough that it made, it made no difference. Amazing. Uh, okay, I'm gonna unmute everyone. I, I don't know how that's gonna work with okay. questioning, but I hope it's not a cacophony of, uh, of sound that comes across, but um, uh, let, let's see how that, this goes. If necessary, I'll mute and then choose people to, to ask questions. So I'm just going to unmute all now. So I think Roger's got his yeah. hand up first. Okay. Roger? Yes. Just wanted to ask, uh, Tom said that uh, after, uh, with the 8,000 passes uh, to go to Palestine, Tom said that after November, if they weren't worth anything, could you explain that please? Yes. Uh, what happened was uh, in November, um, Hitler got very fed up with, so. even more fed up with uh, Horty, the Hungarian governor, who stayed who, after the first episode, which I told you about when the, the German army came in. He was left in office, but obviously his, his uh, room for maneuver was curtailed. And in fact, he, he tried, he stopped the deportation of the Jews uh, and, and conflict, was in conflict with Eichmann. And the reason for that was that it was a question of sovereignty. He didn't want that uh, another nation should be uh, killing the Jews in Hungary when they're his Jews. So actually, he stopped the deportations in, in uh, July. Uh, and in September, he put out feelers for a separate peace, seeing that, you know, uh, the war was obviously being lost. Mm -hmm. So as a result, uh, the Germans put in a different government. They kidnapped his son and kept him hostage to make sure uh, they had him under control. And they put, him a, uh, put in a different government uh, of the local Nazi party, which was called the Arrow Cross Party. And these were uh, absolute hooligans. Uh, 
this 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 stuff of the earth. Uh, these are the people who uh, marched Jews to the banks of the Danube and and shot them, so that they would fall in the, the bodies would fall in the water and didn't have to be disposed of. Uh, they broke into all of these protected houses, uh, and again. One of the uh, reasons we were lucky is we didn't stay in that protected house uh, of the Red Cross because these houses were emptied, most of them, and the, and the Jews marched to the uh, Danube and shot. So this new government didn't uh, honor any of the, the papers that had been issued. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Other questions? Carol? Yes, I wanted to know when you were liberated by the, the Russians. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, was your home still intact and available? Did you go back to your home? Um, I don't know the details. Eventually, we went back to, the, to the, that home. Uh, I, I lived there. I remember it. I was four years old when we moved away from it. But exactly uh, how much later and what condition it was in, I don't know. So we did go back, yes. And did you, was the stuff there? I, I don't think so. I, I don't know. Anyone got a question? Uh, yeah. Andrew, Andrew Kaufman. Uh, yes, just, just a quick question. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, Karl Lutz, who's yes. Fairly well known, I think, um, as, as someone who did, did save a lot of the Jews. Um, has, has he been recognized as a righteous Gentile by Yad Vashem? Uh, oh, yes, definitely. But the, the recognition and even the information about him only started coming out in around 1980, 80 or 90. Uh, now, uh, there is a memorial to him, very nice one, in Budapest, as it happened. And his daughter, um, who is half Hungarian, uh, he, he found a lady during this time in Budapest, daughter called Agnes. She's collecting a lot of information about this. She came to London about 10, 15 years ago and gave a talk at uh, Spyro at the time, the Spyro Center. And I was in touch with her. and. Uh, you know, she's trying to make sure that he gets uh, recognition. adequate recognition. Good, good. He's a righteous gentile. He's, he's a righteous gentile, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Um, do you, first of all, I'm curious to know what business your father did have. Um, and second of all, have you got any photos you could hold up and show us of your parents? Oh dear. Uh, we're, uh, we're not home, we're down in our holiday place, uh, and I'm afraid I don't have any uh, photographs to show you, but another occasion, definitely. Um, what was the first part of the question? What, what business was oh, your... What business was? <laughs> yes. um, he was in uh, textile printing, mm -hmm. um, or textiles altogether, but he was in textile printing, that's where he was a technical director of a public company that was a textile printing uh, firm. He was uh, sacked when the Jewish laws said that uh, Jewish laws means anti-Jewish laws, um, that Jews were not allowed to be officers of public companies. So then he started his own business. Um, then then you were, Jews were not allowed to own a business. So uh, he uh, passed it over to the uh, non-Jewish friend, the same one that got the papers from him later, and worked there as an employee. Um, but after the war, what happened was the way he uh, started this new business, which was a textile uh, dying and pre uh, I don't know the technical terms, but preparing raw textiles to, to be usable, including dyeing. Um, when he was uh, with the Russians, uh, the quartermaster came to him and he said, uh, I've got these zillion uh, yards of material and I want to ha have them dyed the color of Russian uniforms. 
where shall I go? <laughs> and he, he said, this is the way he told it. He said, uh, you know, give me an order and I'll do it. So the, the Russian uh, quartermaster gave him a, uh, an order, which he, uh, he, he knew a place that was able to do this. He went to the bank, uh, showed them this, and with that money, he bought the plants. And, wow. and he did the work for the Russian army. And yeah. that's how he started up very quickly uh, in 45. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I've got yeah. a little, I've got a little note. Admin, is it admin? Raised a hand, had a question. No. Who is admin? I, I can't see know. anyone. I've got at the bottom ADMN. Okay, no. Uh, anyone else got a, a question for Tom? Yes, Karen? Karen. Um, I was just interested to know, did you ever want to go back to your original surname? Uh, no. Uh, funny <laughs> enough, but one, my oldest son was asking me the same thing when he was about 18. Um, but I got, it was my identity. I got used to it. Uh, and then after a time, you know, I, I built a professional name of, with that name. Right. And and no, and I always felt that we Jews, our names don't mean anything anyway. <laughs> you know, they were all, uh, uh, well, in, in Hungary, I think it was Joseph II when the ruling was that everybody had to have a surname because before that we were only Ben so-and-so. And it was a question of money what kind of a surname you had. So Kraus was a very cheap surname, oh. whereas my mother's family were very proud because they were called the Rosenberger. Three and, and they were very proud of the er on the end because they put them in a higher class than the Rosenbergs. Great. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Yes. Who is it? It's Pashi. Pashi. Patty. Patty. Yeah. Uh, I was Hi. just wondering, after, after such a long period of anti-Semitism, these terrible things, and you all landed up in England, um, did your father uh, ever experience anti-Semitism here, or did he feel there was anti-Semitism here? Absolutely not. He was a, he was a tremendous Anglophile. He... Uh, as I said, we had nothing, but he was happy, whistling. He, he was in a, a wonderful state. He really loved it here. I have to say that my mother was, uh, became very depressed because she was missing, you know, the change was a big, big thing for her. She was depressed for a number of years, but my father was on top of the world. And we didn't, I mean, I, he's never met, I, I, not that I know of, any anti-Semitism, and really neither have I. What did he do here? Uh, same thing, he found a job in the Evening Standard, silk screen printing. He went to work, he found this, the job was a maiden head, we lived in Golders Green. He had to get there every morning, which meant walking to Cricklewood, because it was before the buses, before the first Time. bus started. Uh, he then took a train to padding the uh, bus to Paddington, train to Maidenhead, and walk to the place. Uh, took him took him an hour and a half, but as I said, he was very happy doing it. How old was he? He was fifty five. Fifty six. And he started from from scratch. Yeah, we we, we had nothing. Wonderful. But he he saw he saw his son through university a PhD and a, a prominent yeah. well, scientist. The, the reason they left at that age was to give me a, you know, a chance in life, undoubtedly, because they, they could have stayed and they would have had an okay, uh, not, not an English style life, but you know, the same life as the others who stayed, stayed behind was okay. Any more questions? Where did you go to school in, in England? Uh, I went to, I started out in uh, Whitefield Secondary Modern School, uh, which is uh, <laughs> just near Brank Cross, Claremont Road, it's still there. And then they had no sixth form as it was secondary modern. Then I went to the Quinton School, 
which mm. is now part of the Kiniston yes. on, in, in St. John's Wood. Yeah. And then I went to uni. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. You did so well. Quinton Kiniston is meant to be the roughest school in London. <laughs> I don't suppose it was then. It wasn't. It, it wasn't. It was, first of all, it was two schools. Kiniston and Quinton were two separate schools. Yeah. Kiniston was a secondary modern and uh, uh, Quinton was uh, a very good uh, grammar school. It had previously been the uh, Regent Street uh, day school in, in the Regent Street Poly building. And it was associated with Quinton Hogg. Um, and that's why uh, it was called Quinton when it moved to St. John's Wood. And I got my prize from Lady Hogg, Lady Hailsham, I should say, Lady Hailsham, school prize. Brilliant. What advice would your parents have given us to being isolated and being, you know, <laughs> scrooging around for food um, on Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a good question. Well, my father's uh, life advice, and I don't think it can apply, was uh, there is always another way, which meant really that when you're in despair, there is think because there's always a way around or there's always another way. Wonderful. I can't quite work out what another way would be in this situation, I'm afraid. Getting up at three in the morning to get on the list for a card. Yeah, well, we, we, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more questions before we? Anyone got anything else to ask Tom before we sort of? We've been on on Zoom for over an hour, which is which is great, and we we've had uh, thirty eight people at, at one point. Thirty eight people. Mm -hmm. Yep, well, I have 30, 37 written down on mine. That's 37 uh, families, that's 380 people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, but it, Tom, it's been absolutely fascinating. Mm, yes. Um, have, you ever, have you ever written this down? Have you written down your story? I'm you writing know? it right now. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm writing right now. And do we get first editions, all of us who've been on? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've written other books, and what I always say, you don't have to read it, you just have to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deal. That's a deal. Can, can I get the boys to get copies? the film right? Sorry? Have, have, have you sold the film right? From? Have you sold the Sorry, film? somebody's asking something, but I can't hear. Have you sold the film rights yet? Have I sold the film right? <laughs> Are you making a bit? <laughs> well, I, I might speak to the boys and see what... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, David Turner. That's David Turner. What does anybody want to be my manager? <laughs> yes. Yeah, she said. Oh, okay. yeah. There's always another way. That would be the time. <laughs> yes. There's always but another Tom, way. You have Tom, the time. This is, Tom, this isn't your first book, is it? No, no, no. How it many isn't. other books have you written? I've written. I can't even. I don't even know myself. Four or five, but only one is published. Oh. Okay. You, you're welcome to buy it. <laughs> I think I did buy it. Yeah, excellent. But remind me what it was called. It was surely it was about Freud and so on. No, it, it was called Triad. Triad. Yes, yes. It, it is. It got, is. I've read it. It's wonderful. Yes. Yes, I've read it. I can recommend it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Thank you, me too. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thanks, okay, everyone. Um, Lawrence, Lawrence, are we are we having are we convening again next Sunday morning at eleven o'clock? Well, is Andrew Marr on next Sunday? Yes. Okay, then we'll be here as well. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but this was this was our first um, our first uh, um, uh, venture into the my story, um, which uh, for, I think it's been fantastic this morning. Uh, it has. I've thoroughly it has. loved it. I was, I was so interested. Thank you, Tom. Um, Thank you. But what we need is we need some more people, preferably, preferably within the community, but, but even someone outside the community to come on and, and give their my story. Um, so um, if anyone can think of anyone or anyone is, is volunteering, please can they send me an email? 
um, or, or phone me and, and you know, we, we can set something up very quickly. Uh, it will require a little bit of homework, a little bit of work, um, but um, uh, Tom has, um, has set the bar certainly very high. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and um, but it, it would be wonderful because it's a great opportunity to you know to see faces, to keep together, to you know to to be part of this community, um, which which is very very strong and uh, certainly is incredibly important uh, in my week at the moment. Um, uh, you know, being in in sort of isolation and lockdown. Um, so please get in touch with me. Um, or Gillian, um, you know, Gillian's very much part of, part of this and, and uh, has far more energy than I have, um, and, and far more knows far more people within the community than I do. Um, being being a new kid on the block, um, but um, uh, I've really thoroughly enjoyed this morning. Uh, th thank you all. Um, I'm getting used to you in Zoom, except I'm, I'm not really sure how you end a Zoom meeting. You just press the button. I think you can can out, right? <laughs> but um, uh, thank you for joining. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank okay. you. Okay. Bye. Love Bye. Bye. That's a love. Be safe and well. Yeah. Thank, thank you, John. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Have a